Coming up on this episode of Faz TV, diversification is the name of the game as we tell the story of summer harvest oils, find out how to become a price setter rather than a price taker, and the challenges and rewards of inviting the public onto your farm. In the heart of Perthshire, Mark Bush and his family add value to their oilseed rape crop by producing high-quality cold-pressed rapeseed oil for a wide range of customers. I'm Mark Bush from Summer Harvest Oils, which is based at Furnifold Farm in Madity. The farm is uh, owned by my father-in-law, David Cameron. It's a 400-acre farm, mixed uh, arable. We grow oilseed rape, barley and wheat, and then uh, with, the, with the pasture, we have cattle and sheep. My background is not from farming. I was originally an IT consultant. Uh, I've worked on projects such as air traffic control management systems. I've worked for the army for a bit. And then from 2000 till 2007, I worked on a trading floor. It was during that period that I met Maggie, my wife, down in London. And around 2007, we both took the decision that London was great, but it was time to move back up to Scotland. And at that point, I knew I didn't want to be in IT. I knew I wanted to do something with food. We moved back into Stirling to start with, and I started to work on the farm yeah. with my father-in-law, looking at what I could do to progress the farm. Summer Harvest was started in 2008. This was after a couple of pilot projects. Back in 2007, my father-in-law said, you know, it'll be time that you'll have to try and find some work on the farm for yourself. So to that degree, I started selling the whey potatoes from a, a farm at farmer's markets. I went knocking on doors at chefs, restaurants, um, to see if they could buy our local produce. I was amazed by the great feedback that I got from this and it proved a, a good success. But potatoes being seasonal, come February, we were running out of um, potatoes to sell. So we looked to see what else the farm could give us. We were growing oilseed rape and has been for about 25 years at that point. In March 2008, I took a tonne of seed and had that contract pressed down in Northumberland. It came back and I did exactly the same process. I started taking the oil to farmers markets. We took it to chefs, we took it to restaurants, etc. Exactly the same as potatoes. And again, we got a great feedback on that. Feedback from the initial one tonne that we got pressed was so impressive that we actually sold out of our first batch of seed before we had more seed to press in the August harvest. And that's what brings us on to the name. Where does the name summer harvest come from? Well, the crop is harvested in the summer. So it's in the natural fit to say summer harvest. That's where the crop came from. That's where the name came from. One of the principles that summer harvest oils is to add value to the crops we grow on the farm. Currently we grow around 70 to 80 tons of oilseed rape, depending on the field and the rotation in the year. There's been three good key moments that uh, along the way with summer harvest. First being a meeting at the Cooper Angus uh, with all seed rape producers, which set the tone, set my mind to go for producing the cold pressed rape seed oil. I was back in January 2008. The next was selling our first bottle in March 2008. That's where the big change came. That's where my father-in-law for the first time suggested that he was now a price setter instead of a price taker. It was quite a moment to sell our first bottle where we could have taken it from the seed to a production and out to a consumer. So after we're up and running, obviously we, the support is needed and routes to market are needed. And we had a massive leg up, massive help and support from the late and great Andrew Fairley, who took a lot of his time to talk to me about my product and its usage, and also introduced me to a lot of his wholesalers so that I could further the, my sales within that sector. The production of our cold press rapeseed oil follows the same model every year. It also shows how we don't change what the farm's done. So in August, the crop gets harvested as normal, gets taken into the store, dried down to the usual moisture level, somewhere between seven and nine percent. It's then in store and I press on a needs basis. So I will take a ton of seed, we'll take that to the pressing room in a hopper. This gets fed into the press. Now, as you can see, the press will is a very simple, almost like a pepper mill. So the seed gets taken through the mill, crushed, the oil gets captured in a, in a trough or tray, if you like, 
and gets taken to a container, the byproduct drops into a feed bag. With the oil in the container, that then fills up around 360 litres, as we say. We then take that oil into a, into a filtering tank. We, we add a filter aid that helps bind all the bad uh, shell, etc., in um, so that it can be filtered out. The filter is a three-stage process. The first one taking the majority of the seed away, the second one refine it down further, and the third filter, which is a, like a micro filter, which gives it its sheen. That's then pumped into another storage container where it is then held ready for bottling. We bottle in two ways. One, five litre, which is sent to food service on a single pump. When we print the glass bottles, We've got a four head filler and they fill four bottles at a time. When we initially started summer harvest, we just had the one product, which was a 500 ml bottle of cold pressed rapeseed oil. We've started work in collaboration with Wild Time, a catering company out at Comrie, and we produce a range of five different dressings using our oil and using the skill set of Andrew Hamer and the facilities of, that Wild Time produce. The dressings that we now produce include apple and walnut, bramble and juniper, chilli red pepper, lemon honey and raspberry. Mark is not afraid to reach out for help and has reaped the benefits of staying well connected in the food and drinks industry. What is really great about the food and drink industry within Scotland is the community. Having to change a career from IT into food production and working on a farm, clearly I haven't had the full skill set that was potentially required to run the business, but in no way has that put me off. You, you quickly learn what you don't know, and there's many resources out there that can help you, Scotland Food and Drink, SAC, Business Gateway, to name a few. There's also a lot of good help out there from and support from your peers. I talk to a lot of food producers now, and we exchange ideas on a regular basis. So some words of advice or encouragement uh, after our 12 years of summer harvest. I believe the biggest thing for diversification is not to try to disrupt the farm that you currently have. What, what can you add to it? What resources do you currently have do you have free space do you have what crops can you use and how can you add value to those have fun with it as well don't choose something that uh, uh, that doesn't interest you. you you're gonna have fun with it you're gonna be living with it for a, a long while i've enjoyed this so much with the 12 years we in fact we're going going for it again we are uh, taking our barley and we're developing the distillery on the farm slightly bigger project than summer harvest but it follows exactly the same principles. We've been growing malt in barley for decades on this farm. We're now gonna take that, malt it, and build a distillery on the farm and produce whiskey. For more information on Summer Harvest Oils, visit www.summerharvestoils.co.uk and stay tuned for their new business venture in Chaffrey Whiskey. My name's Louise Nicholl, I'm a farmer with my husband at Newton of Fotheringham in Inverarity and we have 550 acres here on Fotheringham Estate, we are tenant farmers. We've got cattle, we've got limousin in Aberdeen Angus, um, we have sheep, we also have a herd of South African boer goats. We actually started bed and breakfast in the farmhouse back in 2006. We introduced a cottage um, for self-catering in 2009. We decided to begin our farm tours. The main trigger was basically finances. We were in a position where we felt we would not survive the year and we are tenant farmers as well. Um, so we couldn't sell some land or do anything like that to allow us to gain any capital. I also challenged everybody involved in the, in the business to go away and make £10,000. And I looked at tourism. The trigger for the tours was really that it was something we could look to do without a lot of capital. We see the same landscape every day and we don't actually see what's there. So we decided to... Um, look on the ground and I just remember one night wandering around the farm and actually just trying to take in what would somebody who's never been here see. Louise has decided to start doing farm tours but bringing the public onto your farm is not without its challenges. We had 
more challenges in my own head than we actually had. It's very easy, um, I think, in, in our industry to just be too scared of having the public here. Health and safety, obviously, has to be at an absolute, it's our number one every day. Wasn't too difficult. Um, we're already doing it. We had to do risk assessments, but again, they're all reasonably straightforward. We spoke to environmental health. They were excellent. They were very supportive and gave us lots of help and advice and, and ideas as well on how we could do things without losing the rusticity. We are a real working farm. Bringing the public onto their farm also brings a customer expectation and has to be managed on a daily basis. Every day we, we really need to ensure that um, the place is tidy. Taking the plunge was a big step for Louise. Our local council have uh, a Facebook page um, with Visit Angus and they offered us a slot for the um, B&B to be on uh, their uh, business of the month. Lambing was a way to start. Um, we uh, had pet lambs to bottle feed. Um, and I just realised that if there was a time, it was this. At the end of February 2017, we launched and we haven't looked back since. In March, um, we were really fully booked. So daily, we did tours daily. It was just all learning, just out there, working, telling the story, um, sharing what we did day to day. And uh, it really came quite naturally. Louise has made best use of social media to help drive sales and maintain interest in all aspects of their agritourism offer on the farm. We really grasped the Facebook side of things. That's my main driver. And we went from, um, so I think, 200, about 200 likes at the beginning, which was for the bed and breakfast that we'd run for you know years. Um, and now we're, we're up at, oh, I think it's 15,000 likes on the page and 35,000 followers. We have an, a Facebook post. It's now at just short of 15 million views. And it was of a goat kidding and it has gone worldwide. Having launched the tours, Louise has found a sustainable customer base for her business. Most of our customers are actually locals, mainly Angus, Dundee, but we also have an element from um, the actual staying guests that come to the farm. Um, again, majority of the people that stay with us now will do an experience of some sort. There's a big educational element to Louise's tours, and not just for children. Our tour basically takes in whatever's happening that day on the farm. It's all about teaching people where their food comes from. It's particularly busy at Easter with all the newborn lambs. We can see the cattle, the sheep, we get close up with them, we can hand feed them all, so it allows everyone to engage with how big they are, what their size is. Um, we can collect eggs, we can feed the hens and ducks, we can see the alpacas and we can wander down to see where the, the goats and the highland cows are. Most of the adults will comment when they leave about how much they've actually learned and taken in. It's not just the customers who enjoy the experience, there's personal job satisfaction too and opportunities for the next generation. We have so many people that just comment about how clear the passion we have as farmers and myself for my animals um, is so big, so huge, and that that is very obvious to them. And I love knowing that we are being able to share that with other people. I think the customer service side of things is one of the highlights I have. It gives a real boost to the day. Since we started the tours, it's actually allowed us to be able to provide employment. Our daughter, she's at university. We've been able to take her on into the business and that's given her some purpose to get outside into the fresh air. She's meeting people. It gives her communication skills, um, but also it's given her an income that she's now going to be able to use when she's at university. We also uh, are now looking to take our son on for an apprentice apprenticeship as well, which before possibly wouldn't have been an option because I don't even know if we would have been able to afford that. I'm Scott, I am 18 years old and I've been here all my life and I'm coming back to do a level 6 apprenticeship at the farm. I've got involved with the Ag Tourism Development here by doing, I can do all the tours by myself mainly. I have enjoyed doing it, it gives a bit of variety through your day. Instead of just doing tractor work or livestock work, you get to meet people, speak to people, tell them about what you do. Before, you would struggle without diversifying to have a future, but now there is that chance. 
So has Louise and her family achieved what she set out to do with their agritourism development? The farm tours have given us um, a huge reason to walk out the door every day. Doing the, the agritourism and the farm tours uh, has uh, definitely saved us as a farm. Um, we started off with a survival plan and we've met what we wanted to achieve in that survival plan and more. And there are more opportunities for the future. Louise has plans. Now for the future, lots of opportunities to grow the business. It's just that next step of getting the product um, ready, that people will have something that they can taste as part of their tour experience. And then also give us the extra benefit of being able to sell after as well. But not just for the agritourism, it's allowed us to develop um, meat sales direct to customers, um, which directly benefits the farm. And um, we also have the opportunities that now we can um, bring our family into the business. It gives us succession. In the Scottish borders, one farming family has created a route to succession from its diversified business model. The challenge has been how to manage the resources within the business so that it works for both generations. My name is Denise Walton. We came to Peelham in 1993, so it's 650 acres. We are primarily livestock farmers, organic and pasture for life. The principal reason for selling direct when we first started was actually we wanted to be price makers rather than price takers. What we first started with was actually pork from our Tamworth pigs. Pigs were the easiest and the easiest to sell and the easiest to get butchered locally. And everybody loves a sausage. So we started producing veal from our beef sucklers in 2004. 2008, we set up our own butchery and then we were able to introduce lamb and beef. But the reasons for going organic in 2007, as new entrants, we came in with very, very little capital. Organic was very expensive to go into until the CAP reform, of course. The more we sold direct from the farm and the more we developed our unique selling point, the more customers are saying to us, well, you know, if you're saying you're environmentally friendly, why aren't you organic? Then other customers were saying, well, how do we know you're environmentally friendly? So we realised then that we needed to guarantee our promise to our customer with that organic logo and the audit and everything that goes with it. We built the first phase of the butchery in 2008. Prior to that, you know, we had, if you like, established a tenuous market for fresh meat direct from a farm. I was using a local butcher to experiment on charcuterie. Butchery expansion became essential due to demand for product and staffing needs for space and decent working conditions. The reasons for building the butchery extension were probably one of the most pressing issues was improving the working conditions for our team. Also, we had to, had to give them more space to work, even under normal circumstances. The benefits of selling their produce directly to consumers have been threefold. Firstly, financial. So the financial benefits of selling direct have, as a farm business, greatly increased farm turnover. And it's provided us with an, an additional income stream. Selling direct meant that we avoided the volatilities of the commodity market. We were masters of our own financial destiny. Secondly, Denise and Chris have also been able to realise their vision for ecosystem restoration at Peelham. Because we are in control of the influences on our productivity, we can control how our environment is managed. The environmental stewardship is very much at the heart of what we do and is, drives all of our ethos and it matters to our customers. Eight kilometres of hydro restoration, 11 hectares of woodland, we've increased open water areas sevenfold, the ecosystem habitat infrastructure also is important because it, you know, Habitat for wildlife is also habitat for livestock. In addition to um, being certified organic, we are a certified pasture for life farm um, and have introduced rotational grazing into our farm system. And that's had a huge benefit, not only 
are our cattle looking better, but also I can tell that the rest periods between grazing in the paddocks that we're getting more species diversity in our grassland. And thirdly, there are significant social benefits to becoming customer-facing as a business. Together with Chris Hanks and myself, that's nine full-time and two part-time on the farm. In the team, we've got local people from the local area, and that builds a sense of community because it brings the community into our farm. We've been able to mentor apprentices, young local people in the rare skill of butchery and craft butchery and whole carcass butchery. There's, there's a wonderful community of farmers and sellers who sell direct to customers. Because we engage directly with our customers, we do a lot of customer facing, we build up really good relationships with our customers. The business has undergone a succession process with Denise and Chris's son Angus recently joining the business. He came in really initially as, as the farm manager and then there's been the progression to succession. We've hugely improved farm infrastructure. Also, Angus has brought in new energy, new dynamism, new ideas, new vision. And so we've improved farm machinery, improved farm infrastructure. And also he now has a young family and he said, look, you know, my family come first. I don't have the resources and we don't either to manage three breeding enterprises. So he's reduced it down to cattle and that's what his focus is on. We collaborate with other farmers who have the same ethos, the same environmental and welfare standards in order to still produce product through our butchery with the same level of provenance. Succession will always bring a challenge. And I think it's something that's to do with culture around land because one becomes so intimately involved in what a farm and land does because you actually have to intimately learn about the land in order to really work with it. The ecosystem restoration work that we've done is secure. Angus sees the continuation of, of um, ecosystem restoration as very much part of his farming. Learning to live within the environmental constraint of the farm has actually been a really interesting journey of exploration because we're organic farmers, pasture for life, we follow um, agroecological principles, we don't have inputs, so we've learned about what our farm can do for us. So it's working within the natural assets that our farm has got for us. And that's really important. Not least, it means that we can, looking on the finances, we can actually manage our margins better because actually now it's no longer about productivity at all costs, it's about profit management and optimizing profit. Managing that the, the human resource capacity of our business is also about acknowledging and accepting that the succeeding generation want to and will do things differently, but we have the same vision. It's just a different way to achieving it. Hello, I'm Raymond and welcome to the Rural Roundup. This week, the 2021 National Basic Payment Loan Scheme has been announced by the Scottish Government. This is a welcome boost to the industry. Loan offer letters started being issued this week, and this year the loan offers can be accepted online to speed up the approval process. Payments are due to start being made in September. The Working for Waders Small Grant Scheme closes on the 30th of August. Make sure that you use the new application form that is provided. Visit workingforwaders.com for more information. The Food Processing Marketing and Cooperation Fund has been launched. It is aimed at supporting the creation and development of food processing facilities, and this includes buildings, equipment, marketing support, and supply chain efficiency. The deadline is the 12th of September. Visit ruralpayments.org for more information. Reduction and exclusion letters have been issued for 2021 BPS and LFAS schemes. Producers will only have received a letter if there has been a reduction or an exclusion applied to an area or payment. If you have received a letter and have a query, please contact your local ARPIT office or your business agent or representative. Hedges can now be cut from the 31st of August and up to the 1st of March. You may also cut a hedge from the 1st of August 
only if you are reseeding with temporary grass or establishing oil seed rape. You must, however, have sown or seeded the field before the 31st of August. Finally, Nature Scott have started reviewing the 2021 Agri Environment Climate Scheme applications. Feedback is anticipated soon. Stay tuned for more from FAS TV and the Farm Advisory Service. Can you help find and celebrate the best diversified farm business in Scotland? AgriScot have launched a new award for Diversified Farm of the Year, sponsored by Royal Bank of Scotland, supported and facilitated by SAC Consulting. The deadline for applications is Monday 20th of September 2021. Full details can be found by clicking the link in the description of this episode. Next time on Faz TV, we're at King's Arms as the U Hog lambs prepare for market, we meet the beef farmer selecting stock for sale, and we examine one farm's approach to watercourse management. Music